This week I've gotten this horn out to share with you. Part of the reason I got it out actually is I have one of my lovely online horn students has the exact same horn as this and she and I were discussing some of the details about how when you're playing the natural horn you need to have um, a particularly strong stable left hand and what you do with your left arm and holding the instrument because when we're doing all the intricacies with the right hand um, we don't want the instrument to judder about a lot so when I was working with this student um, because we're not in the same room teaching online it was really fortunate that I have the same instrument so we could really get to some of the details of the various approaches to this critical issue of balancing the instrument and this instrument it is made by the eminent horn player and horn builder Lowell Greer. Lowell Greer is such a hero of mine. I had the opportunity to meet him a couple of years back and it was such a such a pleasure. Remarkable gentleman and um, if you don't know his Mozart concertos or the Mozart horn quintet recording or his Brahms which is sensational piece of work. I'd really encourage you to hear his recordings. So this instrument is made by him. I've had it probably about 15 years, I think, maybe longer. Um, and I don't think it was new when I got it. I don't actually get the opportunity to play it that often, which is a bit of a shame. Um, it's a copy of an instrument by Franz Stör in Prague. I would imagine the original would be mid-19th century. Um, and it uses what we call the master crook and coupler system. Most of my natural horns I have independent crooks for every single key. So say we do a Mozart opera, you could well need about eight or nine different crooks for all the tonalities. So we normally will see C alto, B flat alto, A, G, F, E, E flat, D, C and B flat basso. We can get crooks for the keys in between, but they're more rare. So you would have an independent crook for every single key which you put into the instrument. The master crook and coupler system works by having only very, very few main crooks, the master crooks, maybe two or three. And so we've got the, the master crook is the first, this one here. And then what you do is you have a whole selection of these couplers of different sizes. So every time you want to change key to something in between the master crooks, um, you use a series of these loops um, to lengthen the master crook and therefore create other uh, tonalities and there's a lot of positive things about this. For starters you can pack very light weight because you don't need to have so many pieces of tubing so it's very practical from that point of view. Um, the disadvantage tends to be that getting back to this idea about how you balance the instrument, the instrument tends to be um, moving further away from the body for certain crooks so there's that issue. It can be a bit difficult if you need to make quick crook changes you do need to know exactly what you're doing you need to kind of work out what that plus that plus that equals. Um, so yeah that's the master crook and coupler system and I've also got this is rather nice this was one of my first period mouthpieces. Um, this is a moosewood copy of Lowell Greer's Courtois mouthpiece so it's a Lowell Greer mouthpiece and a Lowell Greer horn. And what I wanted to share with you this week um, is partially in light of, um, a, I've got a new disc that came out a few weeks ago called Beyond Beethoven. And the driver for that recording and a few others that I've done has been this slight resentment I have about the Beethoven horn sonata. It's a great piece, but it tends to be if people learn to play one piece on the natural horn, it's often the Beethoven sonata. If people put one classical stroke early romantic piece into a recital programme, it tends to be the Beethoven. The Beethoven tends to get played a lot. And we have so many other pieces from this period. 
tons and tons of sonatas by other composers, um, often composers who didn't write their sonata in as much as a, <laughs> of a rush as Beethoven did his. Um, so it, I just love having the opportunity to play these other brilliant works for horn and piano from this period. Um, and so this week I'm playing the slow movement of Danzi's E-flat major sonata, opus 28. There are two Danzi sonatas, the E-flat major and the E minor. I, I think I've... the E minor? I, I prefer, but that's probably because it's a very unusual tonality for us, whilst E flat major is a bit more normal. And so this week I'm playing the slow movement of the Danzi E flat major sonata. This was a work that was published, I think, 1804, so only a couple of years after the Beethoven sonata. And there's a really nice, quite extensive review in the AMZ, the Allgemeine Musikalische Zeitung, the, one of the music newspapers of the time. And it describes the combination of horn and forte piano as extraordinarily lovely. So this is the slow movement of the Danzi Sonata in E-flat on my Lowell Greer Franz Stor copy. Hope you enjoy. <laughs> 